All right, good morning, everyone. I'd like to get started so we can stay relatively on time. Um, thank you so much for coming today. And um, I have to welcome you to Avery Hall and also to Avery Storm, which has been rather hectic uh, for everyone. And I really appreciate all the speakers who've um, had some delays, rather significant, but are here nonetheless. So um, I'm really pleased to welcome you to the school and to begin today's uh, symposium on housing called Acts of Design, New Housing Paradigms in North America. Um, I think before really starting, I just want to extend some thanks uh, also uh, to the dean for her support for the conference today, also in general to supporting uh, the housing studio. Uh, the studio um, has been a, a very long, has a long history here at Columbia and uh, recently we've been traveling, and so that's been a large undertaking for the studio. Um, so thanks to her uh, for that. Also, I want to draw some attention to um, an exhibition of the students' work and some of our travel uh, that is in the uh, kind of the exhibition space at the top of the stairs on the way to the elevator. And so to thank Irene Sun Wu and Tiffany, um, as well as all the students who put together their work that they've done so far this semester. Uh, so that will give you a little bit of a reflection on what we've been looking at in the housing studio. Um, and also to Lila um, and to Lucia and, and Stefan Bodeker, um, who have been very instrumental in making this day come about. So thank you so much for all your hard work um, for today. So a little bit of an overview of the housing studio. Um, it is a studio that's been offered at the school for somewhere between 45 and maybe 50 years. So there's a very long history and uh, somewhat tradition at the school, perhaps maybe one of the only traditions. I think Columbia isn't necessarily known for traditions. Uh, but nonetheless, we are always looking at housing here in the architecture program, in the Masters of Architecture program, and in the core sequence. So it is the last uh, semester in the core sequence in the second year uh, this semester fall studio. Um, this, there are about a uh, little under 90 students and we have eight studios and we all work together on one site, uh, but each of the uh, faculty members looks at a given problem uh, that I write uh, and write a response and lead their own studio section. So we have uh, a very intense semester um, looking at, in this case, a studio site in the South Bronx. Uh, so the studio is very much grounded in New York and the history of housing in New York. This is in a way to reflect upon the history of the studio at the school and also to acknowledge and recognize that across the faculty and all of the different departments that we have here, um, urban design, uh, urban planning, real estate, historic preservation, the PhD program, uh, and so on, that we have many faculty who have invested much of their careers and their interests in housing, um, from Richard Pluntz, Kenneth Frampton, Gwendolyn Wright, uh, Michael Bell, who's also here today, part of the conference, uh, Reinhold Martin, uh, and, and so on. Not to exclude anyone, the list is quite long. Um, also, practitioners that have been instrumental in working on housing and thinking about the design of housing, from Stephen Hall to Lori Hawkinson, um, and many of our other visitors that come to the school to teach in advanced studios. So I think we're quite strong um, in thinking about issues around housing, not just in New York City, uh, but around the world and globally. Um, and that has been something that the studio itself has come up against in different capacities. And recently, to also think perhaps more carefully about North America, um, and that's something we've been doing now in the studio for the past three to four years. Uh, the students traveled earlier in the semester to Mexico City. It was our second trip in the last three years. Last year we went to Chicago um, and are going to be traveling again uh, probably in the next couple of years, looking again at, at different cities in North America, but we're still thinking about that. Um, this conference then in a way helps serve um, all of us here to think more critically about the issue around housing and design and architecture. Um, so with that said, I'd, I'd like to get started. Um, just a brief overview. Um, I will be um, moderating uh, and or I, uh, organize a conference uh, today. Um, I'm also going to be joined by Adam Frampton, 
uh, who will uh, moderate the second session this morning. He's also teaching here in the housing studio and principal of his own architecture office, Only If, um, and he also uh, works on housing. Uh, Kasim Shepard um, will be moderating a panel this afternoon. Uh, he teaches courses on narrative and digital storytelling in the urban design program at GSAF, and he was the founder of Urban Omnibus and his first book, City Makers, The Culture and Craft of Practical Urbanism, was published last year. Michael Bell, an architect and tenured faculty member here, um, is also going to be uh, a moderator this afternoon. He also led the housing studio for more than a decade uh, prior to me uh, and served as the director of the Master of Architecture program uh, for almost 15 years um, and uh, will be uh, leading a session uh, with some of the practicing architects that are coming uh, later on. And Reinhold Martin will conclude uh, today's um, session by moderating our closing panel. Reinhold is the director of the PhD program and also runs the Buell Center here for um, study of American architecture. Um, so with, with that, I'm going to um, introduce uh, a little bit the first panel where we're going to focus on a collective project or a group project, let's say. Um, in part, um, some of the speakers for today and the thinking of the themes are very much tied and instrumental to the way that the housing studio is working. So on one hand, our conference is really geared to the students um, and that they are working in pairs. So um, I thought it's very valuable for them to see how not only the subject of housing and its relationship to design practices and architecture where housing is located within an architectural practice, but to also look at the way in which architects are now working um, and in perhaps a particular generation, my generation, uh, working more collaboratively and working together um, on certain projects. And so with that, we're going to look at a, a case study, uh, Territorio Gigantes, which is in Los Calientes in Mexico. Um, and it will be formed, I will be the moderator for the panel, but um, I'm so pleased to have here today Derek Delacamp, an architect uh, with his own office, Delacamp Architectos, uh, founded in 1999 in Mexico City. He also has recently taught at Cornell. Uh, Simon Hartman is a founding partner of HHF based in Basel, Switzerland, uh, and is also currently teaching at Yale and uh, on his own, and his office, HHF, is teaching at the GSD. Um, Anna Pujanir uh, is a partner at Mayo uh, and has recently joined the faculty here uh, at Columbia in coordinating Core One. Um, and Tatiana Bilbao, uh, who runs her own office, Tatiana Bilbao is studio uh, in, based in Mexico City, has also been a teacher here at GSAP um, as well as Rice and Yale um, and has been um, coordinating and overseeing the uh, project uh, Territorio de Gunti's master plan um, and organize the architects for the panel. So I think um, if we're ready, I understood Tatiana is here. Yes, hi, great. And so she will be the first speaker. Thank you so much. Thank you and good morning, everyone. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you, Hillary, for organizing these. I think um, it, is, it is a project that um, uh, we've been doing collectively, as Hillary said. And I think it's an incredible opportunity of thinking how can we imagine housing um, in, a, in a very specific context of Mexico. But obviously, um, I think the issues that we're tackling are issues that could be basically um, applicable in many, many ways to the whole world. Because we're talking about what collectivity means, what a community means, what those ties can make this place a better place for humans to live. And um, the project uh, started almost probably five years ago, um, and this is located in a city um, in the center of the country, in the state of Aguascalientes. The city is the same name of Aguascalientes. It's a relatively small city for Mexican standards. It's a bit, a, 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 a bit bigger than 800,000 people. Um, what it is also kind of so, uh, not standard from Mexico, it's that it's a city that it's very well planned. Um, and it's a city that has a, a, and enjoys a specific quality of life that it's a little bit in higher in average of that of Mexican cities. Um, it's a capital of a small state, but it's a capital of a wealthy small state. Uh, but it also shares the pr same problematics that probably all the cities in the world, housing, how to house all the people there. 
um, and how to house it with a st standard or good quality of life. So um, this city uh, is crossed by a power line that divides when it touches the city. And um, uh, currently, and the government decided to relocate that line or to uh, sub uh, subterrain it. And um, this leaving a big part of, uh, of, um, uh, of the city with uh, an opportunity to be built. This city, uh, this, this site basically has an, uh, an impact that goes to 38% of the size of the city. So we were hired to do a master plan, um, as I said, five years ago. We analyzed the whole city, as this is a, a project that impacts really the metropolitan area. And we understood the potentials of the site. It's very well located and it's very central to the, to the city. And it is easy linkable in many, many ways, although it's a line and that right now creates kind of a scar in the city, that it's empty um, uh, just uh, with these power lines running on top of it. So we understood that uh, we needed to break that limit that this um, line poses to the city um, tissue, and we needed to understand how to knit that um, in order to provide also housing, densified housing, and uh, mixed program in, in order to uh, try to keep the, the expansion of the city to the west, to the inner part of the city. There was uh, done a very big master plan that included the whole area. Uh, we call it Programa Parcial, which is a special plan uh, of land use and direction of the whole zone. And then we were um, uh, proposing a master plan for, the, for exactly those sites that were going to be liberated by the, uh, um, the removal of the power lines. We wanted to create a strategy, as I said, that with, with the, the existing green spaces would link this area easily, pedestrianly, but also vehicularly to the center of the city. Um, and this way, trying to erase that scar that the, the line really uh, imposes right now. We proposed a, um, a master plan that included several um, and mixed uses, trying to fulfill a little bit of those uses that were um, lacking in each sector. We divided the plan in four sectors, and we worked by sectors. We understood specifically the characteristics of each one, and we proposed uh, specific um, uh, programs for each of them. And then, um, uh, after three years of work, uh, the government changed. The government um, elected a different uh, governor from a different party, and normally in Mexico, this means the projects are dead. That's it, end of it. But fortunately, the governor that arrived then saw a big opportunity and wanted to retake the project back. And uh, so he asked us to continue developing the project, uh, the master plan that was in a schematic, um, at a schematic moment, and at the same time to develop two blocks. So we saw it as an incredible opportunity of uh, first developing the two blocks and then informing back the master plan. Since the master plan had no rush, we thought it was very important to um, hold, hold the master plan back and try to, to think how that those, uh, the design of those two blocks could inform the master plan then. So what to do? Invite, invite six architects from different parts of the world to do it. We went to the site and uh, the government uh, decided exactly which of the two blocks uh, were needed to be developed. One was going to be developed, the north one, by the government, the, 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 seat, uh, the um, housing department of the government of the state, and the south one by the Infonavit, which is the bank that subsidizes and founds the housing in Mexico. And uh, so we brought all these architects to Mexico City uh, for three days. We started having uh, first workshops in the table without uh, first going to the site, understanding what could be a collective idea for a proposal for these two plans. Uh, we gave, uh, we put in the table a lot of uh, ideas, and then we went to the site all together. 
Um, we discussed the possibilities, we discussed the intense uh, relationship to the, uh, that this side has to the neighbors and the, the difficult relationship that this poses. We started sketching and understanding what could happen there, discussing several hours. And at the end, we end up these three days with general smaller master plans for each of the blocks. Uh, the north block uh, developed by Archilab in, in Architects, Macias Peredo and Work AC. And the south block developed by Moss, Estudio Mayo, HHF, Derek Delecam, Dogma and ourselves. And uh, this way, we decided how to create a collective that was designed by everybody, and then specific buildings designed by each of the offices. Um, then we, uh, each of us went away, worked with our own buildings. We decided to do a checkboard that would allow to bring those combinations of uh, individual uh, projects together. And then uh, we started uh, discussing again what is that public ground that would give this cohesion or, or collective idea in this place. We started uh, purposing those plazas and those collective areas, understanding that this could become a platform of equal materiality, but with richness of program that would allow to be uh, literally the platform for those uh, living units designed by different architects, uh, uh, but combined and interposed uh, within each other. And this is how uh, we arrived to the final design. Um, that it's uh, already um, done. Construction's documents are delivered this past week. And I think that the diversity of those designs really allow for people to, to identify or to, to be in conflict with the place as much as be in this collective space that will reunite all of them together. What we did, and I'll do it very quickly, uh, the strategy of our own buildings was to understand that we had to build with uh, the, the building is four typologies, uh, four sizes of, um, of um, units, and we decided to use those four units uh, and interpose them um, on different floors to create this idea of progression uh, that the stair would lead you then. Um, a little bit a trick to understand how within this regularity that we needed to to, um, to achieve for costs reasons would give us the possibility also to create a singularity for each apartment. So a slight difference with a big uh, possibility of giving and encouraging for a better living in this place. Thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna quickly share a small number of projects that have to do with two things. Like a much larger collective effort uh, where many of my colleagues here have been also involved. And um, also the Centro de Investigaciones Infonavit, who has had a, an incredible number of initiatives that have kind of united us around these uh, different projects. And uh, also uh, the earthquake, the earthquake that uh, happened almost a, a little over a year, which while it was a tragic event, it, it is also true that it has been a major cattle uh, catalyst force to bring a number of architects to work together in issues of social housing and public space. So like uh, two years ago, uh, the, this research center of Infonavit, led by Carlos Cedillo and Julia, who is here with us, um, they did this project called Territorio, uh, del Territorio al Habitante. So they asked a number of architects, I think it was close to 100 architects, to design a prototype house for a different bioclimatical uh, case. So we worked in, uh, we had uh, done a number of projects in wood and we were assigned this uh, house or prototype house in, in the area of Michoacan where there is a wood uh, community. And uh, this, so we designed this more like a structure than a specific house. And then later, uh, Infonavit commissioned Moss, Hillary and Michael, to do a master plan to build these houses, 30 of them, in this place called Apan. And this is just a quick image of their master plan where they designed the upper building. It's like the, the main building that has services. And then this, uh, the 32 prototype houses. Later, they, uh, this is uh, like three weeks ago. So these houses are almost finished and there should be an opening in a few weeks. I'm sure Julia will talk about that. 
Um, so later they did this competition for this lower lot here that was like the missing piece with the master plan. And uh, the, the program for this building is a laboratory for materials, which kind of reinforces the idea of this experiment or museum of different prototype of housing. Uh, we entered the, the competition and we won with this proposal. And this is the other major project that kind of brings us all together, this group of colleagues, uh, the one that Tatiana just explained and that we will be talking further in, in the kind of the discussion. So like I said, the other really big event uh, was the earthquake. Like many of you must know, uh, there had been an, an, um, an earthquake just 32 years to the exact date. Uh, so this 19th of September of 2017, we were hit with this really big earthquake. Uh, this is a map, the blue dot right here is where our office is. And the, build, the red dots are buildings that were either collapsed or had major um, damages. The yellow ones are the ones that had a lesser damage. And I'm showing this image to kind of see how close we were to kind of like the epicenter of the, the area that was most uh, damaged in Mexico. And also because uh, these are two images are just buildings just a few blocks away from our office. And what I pretend with this is to just show how uh, personal it was. And, and I, I can even say that it was a life-changing experience for everyone in the office that kind of really reset our efforts and reset our focus in our work we were doing, the work we were doing with, with housing. Uh, this is a number which I think is conservative, maybe Julia can give us another number, but of the number of houses in rural areas that had to be abandoned, that, I mean, that either collapsed or had major damages. In the later days after the earthquake, uh, through WhatsApp, the, a number of architects built this platform that was called Reconstruir Mexico, Tatiana was a big part of it, Carlos Cedillo was a big part of it, and in just a few days we had almost like 150 participants. It was, uh, I mean, the energy in it was really incredible. They, they formed a number of groups that were gathering uh, to kind of, kind of uh, structure this effort. In everyone in their own offices were doing kind of like the immediate things that they could help with. In our office, we had so many people from different countries that we served as translator for people coming from abroad uh, to check for safety in, in public buildings or in buildings. And um, later we started, we did a team back and kind of figured out where we would take it from there. And we started working with different ONGs and different institutions institutions which you can see right here uh, and kind of led us to a further effort uh, down the line. So this is kind of the area where it happened and I'm just going to briefly walk you through the number of houses. This is interesting because this is kind of like uh, an image of kind of the, the, the context where we're working with these houses, really small rural communities that had an incredible damage both in their public buildings and in their housing. So through these ONGs and institutions, we were approached to work with these different families and design this uh, really, really small houses with this sense of urgency. In average, these houses cost around $8,000. And uh, what's really, really interesting is this is an exercise that really makes you uh, work or forces you to work with the most essential elements. Many of these communities uh, have incredible limitations, not only in the type of materials you can have access to, but also with the specialized hand labor. So case by case, you have to work with that community and kind of figure out what makes sense there, what's kind of like the right thing to do with uh, each of these specific cases. So uh, these are just quick images. In this case, for example, this uh, earth bricks are part of the materials that you could get in this specific community. This is Salvador. Salvador, this is a moving uh, story. Salvador is blind. This is the, the image of the house where he lived, which was an adobe house. And all that was left is this door that we then later on uh, reintegrated into the project. Uh, Salvador's house because he was uh, convinced that he wanted an adobe house again. And so we worked in this case with what was available. And these are hay packs. So, the, 
then this turned into a workshop in the university for other houses to be built. We also did funding for many of these houses. Uh, so we really kind of integrated ourselves to this effort in a broader way that had not just to do with designing specifically. These are other of the communities where we designed. Again, this is, this is a project led by Infonavit in this case, in this Oaxaca community area that is really, really poor. And um, finally, this project, or how this uh, housing effort kind of led us to later on design public space that is related or interweaved with this social housing and collective effort. This is Jojutla, again, another project led by Infonavit. And what was special in Jojutla, I mean, it was one of these places that was uh, really mediatic because of how much of the public space had been damaged. So in this case, uh, we Infonavit focused more in the rebuilding of public space than the housing space. And so there's a number of uh, different projects here. This is a small bridge that's been commissioned to OMA. There's a Alberto Kalach doing a school. And we are doing two different projects with a really close friend, uh, Camilo Restrepo. And it is a church, which is right here, and a community center, which is up there. And very quickly, this is the park. We, the park had a community center which was uh, really, really damaged to the point where it had to be demolished, which was right here. So we took that as an opportunity to open the space. In this case, get rid of that building up there and open the space to make it public and really integrate it into the neighborhood. And what it is, it's a really simple portico typology that has to do with a grid in the park. This is meant for really simple things like having an ATM, having a tortilla place, and just really like community, really simple community services. And finally, this church also designed with Camilo that had to do with the previous church falling. So this was the 18, uh, late 18th century church of Jojutla, and this was a church that was built in the year 2000. So this one collapsed and this one was damaged to the point that they had to uh, bring it down. So we were, I mean, in this case, Jojutla is, is the, an incredible place in terms of its climate and also its vegetation. So we were immediately inspired by Felix Candela in his open chapel in Cuernavaca, which is just a few uh, miles away from that. And so again, this is an open chapel. Um, that has to do with public space and kind of also what we felt was really moving in this case is kind of like the psychological impact that these spaces have after an event like an earthquake. Thank you. I was nowhere when the earthquake hit. No, I mean, I'm Swiss and uh, I think I'm an example of, uh, it's doubt, it, it's a little bit of doubt if you do social housing um, in Mexico as a Swiss and I, I would be happy that this is also addressed today. So um, we did one little building in, um, in Mexico in another uh, group project that was kind of the back pack or the duffel we had. And I show you quickly the images of a guy who came to our office and said, I have no money, but I have a very nice plot in Brazil and I would like you to do a house. So, um, which made us think of another project we have done in, in China, which is Ordos 100, for those who know that, where um, we had to compete with the situation that 100 different people design a house and we were kind of brought back to ourselves and did something which is the most simple way to construct spaces and with the kind of a stupid joke of the roof being um, our HHF uh, sign for Google Earth, three reasons. Then. So we had this guy coming from Brazil who said, I want to have a house, I'm a fan of yours. And we said, okay, we cannot really deliver. And I think this is the, the question here, what can you deliver as architect in a situation so far away? Um, and we said, I mean, one can do any, with anything a good house, your name is Pat and your plot has the size that we can have a serious P uh, on it. And 
that's what we, I mean, this is then quickly done if you want. So of course it's then more complicated than you think in the beginning, but this is this like use the most common way of how to build and give it something special. These are renders. He duly then did that with his friends there and uh, sent us photographs of the construction process and now it's there, it's built. No? So that was kind of the, the background we had when we were attacking the, the question of uh, how to respond to uh, Tatiana's question or the question of that site. Um, and I mean, I don't have to repeat the master plan, but I didn't know if Tatiana would even make it, so I put these images. So this is the site. Um, it's a site which is kind of difficult, neighborhoods next to it with a lot of introversion, um, uh, but also then uh, uh, we all agreed, we, we saw it and thought this can be a real uh, neighborhood. It's not about emergency housing. It's, not, it's just, I mean, how to build a part of the city. And that's why we were also so happy uh, about this idea of just do one and then inform the master plan and not do a long master plan with everything um, uh, kind of set and, and then to apply it. So we knew it will be something like this wild mix it got in the end. Um, we knew by looking at other examples, we did research, the question, what can we do? You know, with the, 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 the question is clear, you can almost not spend money, um, but you cannot just do the most banal building neither, because otherwise you would have to renounce to the job as an architect from Switzerland, because if it's just about what is the rule there, then uh, we just spent... Uh, miles in the plane and, uh, and money. So, okay, we said what we can do is that we just, I mean, someone picked us for a reason, we don't, maybe don't know why, but we can do uh, so the, the job like we do our jobs and maybe that is then um, a part of the diversity of how people attack a question and this can be, um, this can be uh, like the, the benefit for the project. We got a brief, and we got the brief with the square meters, and we got the brief with the, the question of how to uh, fit that on the plan. You see that that's our plots. Um, even if the checkerboard is very uniform, of course, it creates a big variety of spaces based on the fact that here one is missing, so this one has a different condition here than there. This one is totally at the edge. So we wanted to reflect that in our floor plan um, on the project. Then we had the th second thing, which is that this whole, um, this whole operation is in a slope, which leads to half uh, heights of differences. So we thought maybe we can uh, kind of combine, we do simple houses, combine, the um, entrances to have one expressive moment, uh, mo like an element which is a big common stair, which is also a social space, and we try to um, then do something with that. We saw that um, next to when we drove with the bus, that there is something like a tradition for um, steel, bigger steel operations in the site, which I think has to do with the, with the car industry there, yeah. So, very simple, so we said we can do something special and we can do uh, something with the floor plan, which as a basic uh, idea is, we don't want to have any technical shafts, so each floor, instead of investing in, in uh, technical equipment, we want it to have just all natural ventilation. Now I just go through the floor plans and the, so the, the um, elements. So we have, we, this is kind of the, the program with the smaller uh, housing units in the, in the lower parts and then the question of how to get these light situations we want. Um, it's, uh, one is with this uh, um, round stair, the other one is with the square stair. Uh, here you see the more or less, so this 
uh, floor plans of uh, the most modest parts, which we could uh, do with the double height space to get light, even if you want privacy inside. That's another lower part house. Then we have in the upper floors always this motive of um, you come in and you kind of find then the light in the end. The most simple way, this is a house which is just next to the site. So here also someone uh, kind of gave his, uh, I mean, the, the views and, and the searching for the views in the sun was the main issue. So this is then how these two buildings operate in the whole. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Mana Pujane. I'm uh, here speaking on behalf of uh, Mayo, an office based in Barcelona. It has been an extraordinary project for, I think, for all of us. Uh, it was a great opportunity to, to, to work collectively, but not, not only that, to design collectively. And, uh, and, and as you, and the, the result that we're presenting today, it's quite uh, obvious how this uh, work has influenced the project itself. So you cannot detach the built form from the urban form and vice versa. And that's kind of, that's a real consequence of this going back and forth uh, from offices to uh, collective discussions and et cetera that Tatiana was mentioning. So um, our project for Territorio de Gigantes is, is an evolution of uh, research on type housing typology that we have had at the office for a long time now. And it's a, it's a research on specifically on how um, on ab abstraction in domesticity. Everything started with this uh, art piece uh, that it's uh, uh, an art piece of, uh, from uh, Nicholas Rook, titled uh, Spook Story Without Characters. And we encountered this art piece years ago, and for us was really um, uh, attractive uh, by its, uh, its level of abstraction. So what uh, the artist did uh, was basically to reenact, it's a reenactment on, of uh, a comic, a Donald, Donald Duck comic, and he basically erased all the characters and any, any text and uh, anything that could be literal, and suddenly uh, everything that was at the back on a second uh, stage until then became on the front in, at the first stage, and suddenly a certain level of abstraction allow that any story could happen within the same format. And for us, it was really attractive how to allow this abstraction and how to translate that into the domestic. So we start claiming in the office that what we need was, is actually generic rooms or abstract rooms. So spaces that are not predetermined in, uh, in, in it with its domestic program, but allow any domestic program to happen. At that time, it was a specifically a reaction to how housing was being built in Spain, that most of our housing stock is defined by, to, to, to an uh, address to just one social type, what properly we could uh, call the family type, so uh, based on a um, structure of mother, father, uh, one, two children. And uh, we, we were aware that our uh, society in Spain is mu much more wider, more than the 70% of our society doesn't respond to that uh, uh, social type. So we're claiming to start designing houses that could allow to answer to this wider social reality. Alongside that references, that reference of, uh, of, um, of this uh, abstraction, I, uh, I've been uh, researching about kitchenless houses in, uh, in worldwide, but specifically here in New York. Um, and, um, and at the turn of the 19th, 20th century, um, there was a large um, volume of apartments that had lack of kitchens. And uh, apart from that, um, the rooms were also, the apartments were able to expand and decrease. So suddenly the house was understood as a system where its par the parts could be added and subtracted on demand. And uh, that allowed us to reflect on the need also to have a diffuse limit of the house itself. Why our houses have always the same surface, so therefore the same type of space. Uh, and uh, 
However, and on the opposite, our social need, our life need, changed so much through through our lifetime. So, uh, how to kind of understand our uh, social needs and uh, start proposing houses that can be adaptable to that as well in terms of surface. We start then to talk about the idea of a diffuse house, a, di a house that can be defined depending on our needs in terms of spaces and rooms, and therefore which limits are not clear and predetermined as well. So we're claiming to have not predetermined program houses, but also not predetermined limit, limited surface houses. The first um, attempt to, to put these ideas into practice uh, was in a housing block that we built in Barcelona years ago, where um, the building had 110 rooms that could be um, compiled to form different types of, of uh, apartment. And at the same time, each room was not predetermined in program, so even the kitchen could be placed in any room. At that time, we started working with the idea of big doors, also to raise even in a stronger manner, the ambiguity uh, of the limit of the room itself. So suddenly just uh, a big, like this is kind of simple trick, but a big door allows you to connect to, to rooms. It's really simple, but at the, at the same time, it provides a lot of richness in terms of uh, apartment uses. And I'm quoting all this because definitely for us, uh, Territorio de Ginagantes project has been an evolution of, of, of in this typology. This is our proposal for, um, for Aguascalientes, uh, where every apartment has uh, six spaces, uh, at the same time as uh, generic as possible, and the problem is not predetermined. And the doors, we kept on the idea of uh, using big doors, but as we did a really simple move, and if uh, in Barcelona housing block, we build the doors in the middle of the room. Here, the doors are just in the corners, allowing a larger um, possible uh, flexibility of combining the spaces. So all those um, rooms are subtracted and, and, and added in order to, to allow different combinations. And at the same time, we started to work with the idea of the mistake and the error to raise a specificity in a generic uh, system. And we, um, we learned that on a, in, uh, with a project um, that um, it was defined by a grid, by a strict order, and suddenly that order was producing these kind of mistakes and other spaces when encountering a preexistent limit. And suddenly we realized that thanks to those situations, the order exists. So, and also we start valuing the idea of the mistake as suddenly something that uh, despite a generic uh, set of generic spaces allows you to raise certain type of specificity. So in our, uh, our Calientes, we have this kind of suddenly uh, kind of uh, mistakes that allow to be specific at the same time generic. The structure is really simple. Uh, looking for, you know, trying to make it as simple as possible in order to make it as economical as possible. And on the rooftop, we, uh, we talk a lot about, uh, also with, uh, with the rest of the teams, how to raise collectivity. And not only in the urban plan, but also in our buildings. So in the rooftop, it's, uh, it has just, you know, like two simple, um, the walls that uh, divide the rooftop in four spaces, and uh, our aim is to kind of invite appropriation on that uh, rooftop. So in Mexico, if you have a wall, suddenly you're gonna have uh, something built on it. So accepting the idea of appropriation and growth through time, through little glimpses. So for us, these walls, we know that they're probably gonna fence and you know, like try to appropriate those spaces in the future. And for us, it's accepting kind of the, the nature of the place itself. And also, instead of uh, designing a simple, simple um, um, stair, what we did was to expand it to the point that it's ambiguous in a sense that it's not 
It's too big to be just a stair, but it's not adequate to be a proper private terrace. So suddenly this kind of odd device for us is an architectural apparatus that forces discussion and dialogue among neighbors. So in order to fence it and therefore to appropriate it for yourself, you have to discuss with your neighbor and to kind of achieve an agreement among neighbors. That's why the, the form themselves, if you look at them, each building has its own form. So for us also, it's kind of an experiment. It's something that we really like from uh, Infonavit, that they were all the time encouraging us to push the boundaries and uh, to uh, propose new typologies and test those typologies for future uh, social housing. Uh, typologies, and we thought that, um, okay, let's try different forms in different buildings and uh, as a laboratorium to understand how different neighbors and can occupy those odd forms. So we have from really simple ones to extremely big ones. And for us, those terraces are definitely a place in between the, pri the most private and the most public and in between a space that allows to connect the domestic and to the urban and to expand uh, domesticity to the urban space. Thank you very much. Um, I, I thought uh, it would be good to just have maybe a general discussion about the process of working together a little bit um, and also you know, to, to talk a little bit more carefully about collaboration in the context of your offices and um, thinking through the problem of housing. Um, so that's sort of one point. I guess maybe three, maybe three things we could touch on all together. I think just that, a, a sort of synopsis of collaborating um, and what that means in each of your practices, because I think all of us to varying degrees have had experience with that. Um, but I think it would be worthwhile to talk about that in the context of also the subject of housing. And because we're, as architects, we're often collaborating with, with each other, with colleagues, with consultants, but then to also look at the community as a collaborator in a way and interfacing with them at different, at different levels um, would be good. I think I would also like to talk a little bit about issues around um, public space, because this came up in almost everyone's presentation. And I, I often reference in teaching an essay by Lena Bobardi, um, where she writes about houses to museums and kind of questioning and, and sort of claiming that houses are not just houses and thinking about housing. And it has to include also amenities. And she doesn't use the word amenities, but that idea of what, are, what else informs housing in a more cultural level, um, that you can't just build housing without, without that component. Um, and I think in the case of um, Gigantes, how that is addressed or how, you could, how you've been addressing that in your, in your practice. Um, and I guess maybe in just a more direct way, because this is also a question somehow for the students as well, since we visited uh, Mexico City in the beginning of the semester, um, and we also visited many of your offices, which was amazing for the students, I think, to um, look at your work in advance and then have the opportunity to come to your office and see um, how you're working and the types of projects you're working on. Um, but how, how you, um, and maybe for, for this side, more of the table, um, who may have not worked in Mexico before, but what, what are the takeaways from, from that experience? So anyway, I'm not sure maybe where the panel would want to start exactly, but. Um, yeah. Well, I can take on collaborations. Um, I truly believe that um, architecture uh, nowadays must be a collaborative act. Um, I don't understand how to do architecture if not, mm -hmm. especially if you're addressing a collective problem. I think uh, designing it collectively will allow uh, for that complexity and um, uh, even a little bit of chaos on it that could beat those possibilities of more mm. people to identify with the, with the place, mm. to have more relationship with it, even if it's a complective one. Mm -hmm. uh, and therefore, it's very hard to achieve that when you have one soul mind. Mm -hmm. So for me, really, um, architecture has become um, a collaborative act, and not only as a possibility, but as a necessity. Yeah? 
And I think specifically in this project, um, I think that for me was very important to also bring to the table um, minds that were thinking uh, about collective housing elsewhere, not mm -hmm. only in Mexico, because we often, um, um, we know how to, to operate in our own territory. And definitely we have a certain um, even more constraints than elsewhere mm -hmm. because uh, really when uh, in Mexico, when you mean social housing or minimum housing is minimum, absolutely minimum. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to bring those exterior uh, thinkers uh, that would be thinking on collective housing in different places of the world, even as uh, in diff so different contexts as Simon in Switzerland, in order to, to have that perspective, in order to understand if those possibilities were able to also accommodate in, in this context. So, um, well, I, I do uh, uh, understand that, um, uh, therefore, giving uh, a collective platform to a, a, a response of a collective housing mm -hmm. was the key for specifically this project as well. Um, hi, my name is Jacin Schleich, I'm uh, Derek's partner, and, and I think it's really, a, what Tatiana said, it's really true. So um, we were doing uh, social housing, a lot of exercises before, and we are really already on track somehow in, in one direction because we already know how much can it cost, mm -hmm. how to optimize the square meters, how to fit everything that, that it's uh, at the end viable to to build sometimes we achieve it some sometimes we don't and with this exercise having people from 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 other places um they showed us somehow really uh, other approach they made their effort on other points than than we did and that makes it really um this opens really up the possibilities, and I think it's it's also the the, the whole idea of this master plan is to show uh, possible developers for all this trip what is possible, uh, and not to do always always the same things. So in that sense, it was really good, and 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 I'm sure everybody struggled a lot with their uh, reality, you know, because of, of how many square meters the mix was really really um, strict what we had to achieve. The cost was really low. Uh, the material palette was really narrow. So so all did an effort, but always preserving what they wanted to uh, to achieve. So, and, and I think an, in Anna's case, that was this collective space of the stair and the roof. And in, uh, in Simon's case, it was the, it was this, uh, natural light and ventilation for all the rooms. And I think that the, uh, they, they achieved that. So I, I think it's, it was um, quite successful until now. We hope that it goes on. I, I would like to add to Tatiana's comment about the collective um, process, or is only collective a way to do, I mean, I think we all struggle, this has maybe less to do now with social housing, but we all struggle with the fact that there is the uh, architecture. I mean, if it just stays long enough, people will have the possibility to come up with their own narrative. You know, they get, they get a building is there, and if it's long enough there, then um, it, it will uh, mean something to someone. And then um, in our profession, we try to give a start you know, to a project, make it have a meaning or, or more of a meaning already by something we pack on top of it, something um, we give which is not only the function. And um, I think this you can do as an as a individual person and or you can do it as a group. I just think that the individual statement of an architect, of the, the, the creator, always smells a little bit difficult for me today. And um, I think that these group projects have an interesting side, which is it's from the start, not about uh, 
Anna did that or Tatiana did that, but it's about, it's a conversation, it's not so absolute, it's about uh, a few people who try to engage in a conversation about what is important now for that project in a specific moment. And that is then already interesting enough that uh, you can refer to that when you live there, when you, um, when you, when you are interested in that. So um, I really think that this is what happened between us. We will see then if it's ever built. No, I mean you never know with these kind of projects. But um, I think that no one of us um, came to Mexico with the plan of what to do. No one of us um, uh, left with a precise idea. And I mean, so in, in the end, uh, we all had to react to each other, even if we did not do a set of rules more than this kind of checkerboard and uh, what Infonavit gave us as, a, as a, uh, like no, normal social housing rules. And, and I think this is, this is really nice uh, to do as a project, but I also think it's only relevant as a prototype mm -hmm. and not so much as a, then a way of how to do a big number of houses. Could you maybe talk a little bit about, um, I think for more for the sake of the audience perhaps, and because we talked a lot about this with the students, even because they were able to go there, but to see, um, you know, the, you know, for maybe lack of a better way to put it, but the incredible you know, design culture that exists in Mexico City, I think, especially right now amongst architects, and um, that there is a very strong scene there, um, just in general, I mean, speaking more broadly, and in relation to, let's say, New York, for instance, which has its own set of, um, you know, characters and uh, concerns going on. I think it would be worthwhile to talk a little bit about that. I think, you know, maybe even the, I would say, m my observation from working there uh, with all of you and with Infonavit, especially that the there is an incredible intensity and concern about building. And as I think Derek, you presented, of course, you have situations like earthquakes that are, um, you know, obviously important to consider and at a wide scale. And um, but that the investment in building and the thinking through materials and uh, location and variety of different climates, even um, thinking about the work for Apan and um, all the different houses that were designed across the whole country, then ultimately had to be reconfigured for this one location, for instance. But the, the thinking that's going into all of that work right now, it would be interesting to hear a little bit more from you guys about that and observations versus, let's say, other places, because you're also all working in other other places. Um, you know, I, yeah. I'm so always happy when I disagree. I okay. do not agree. <laughs> and I think, I really think that from what I have seen in Mexico, most of it is bad architecture. No, I mean, what is built is, I mean, like everywhere in the world, no? I mean, wherever, it's not a special concern. I'm not, and then there is a, a, a scene of people who are, do good uh, objects, but this is everywhere the same, that this is only a very reduced amount of people who even care about mm. the questions we talk about. And I think uh, it's beautiful that this exists, but I mean, I, I do not, um, uh, like across the country, and I think, wow, so many mm. thoughtful buildings, but I, I, can, I could not tell you mm. any place mm. in the world where I feel that. <laughs> so, um, um, but I think it's beautiful that this younger generation has the possibility to do, no? It's the same in Switzerland. I mean, well, I think yeah. what um, in, in Mexico, what is true is that um, in the 80s and 90s, there were really no architects involved in the discourse or even the design of social housing, mm -hmm. no? So mm -hmm. it, it, it happened very clearly at a time where uh, the rules changed. Mm -hmm. mm, two things happened in parallel, the neoliberalization of the economy versus the um, uh, like privatization of communal mm -hmm. land mm -hmm. and the necessity of finding a scheme of producing massive social housing for the 
increasing um, migrants from the urban, uh, rural areas to the uh, uh, urban areas that led to a production of houses that it was just like an industrial production, no? <laughs> uh, developers producing boxes uh, in millions, literally 11 million homes were produced in uh, a, a bit of more than, tw a little bit more than 20 years in Mexico. And I think what is di different nowadays is that there is a generation that it's involved in the production of social housing mm -hmm. by being first critics of the system mm -hmm. and by understanding it, getting in and trying to propose different things. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, being given the opportunity of participating by institutions like Infonavit mm -hmm. or uh, private developers as well, that are, um, uh, that it's really changing the scene, at least in Mexico City, and I don't, don't mm -hmm. know how it's comparable to other places, mm -hmm. but what it is different uh, from last decade to this decade in the, in the country is that, you know, that the, there's a generation of architects uh, with an amount, uh, important amount of interest in social housing and in going uh, in tackling these, these problematics. But still it's only the 1% of... Yes, if we, can yeah. you quantify, is of it everyone? Yeah, yeah but I don't... Every day anywhere, no? Like you said, so yeah. but I do think that I in, think in the Mexico, <laughs> and tying these two previous um, commentaries, I do think that there is a generation right now in Mexico that I agree in very little numbers, but uh, yet that has formed a body of work that I think is kind of interweaved or related in the sharpness of how they have answered to a specific reality. And I think that's also true for a generation of architects right now in Switzerland. I don't know if you could consider the same thing in Spain, mm -hmm. but I think it has to do with uh, a number of architectures, ar architects uh, having opportunity to build on the public space and on these commissions that have a social impact. And, and the other factor being that there uh, is like a common vision. And I think that is new to Mexico. I agree with Tatiana, that was not the case with previous generation of architects in Mexico. I think, I mean, yeah, like, I think it's everywhere the same, but what I, what I value a lot about working in this project and working in, 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 in Mexico is actually there's a huge difference between how social housing is produced in Spain and how social housing is produced in Mexico. And, uh, and we, we know that because we have like, two projects on the, on the table that are you know, in, with the same goal, mm -hmm. one in Barcelona and one in, in Aguascalientes. And, um, and the, the discussion and how they're addressed it is so different. As I was mentioning in the talk, like Infonavit since the beginning asked us to, to kind of produce something that could push the discipline further and could push social housing further, understanding the contemporary complexities and how our society behaves. So they were asking us not to replicate all models, but rather to reflect on all typologies and to understand how those typologies should evolve in order to understand contemporary conditions. And I think that that's a question, for instance, that we don't find in, in, in social housing in Spain, where um, most of the program is predetermined, um, most mm -hmm. of uh, even, even the, you know, the, the, the law is taken to a point that you can, you can almost not propose anything else than it's not defined by the law. So I think that uh, also, um, I think that that's the main difference. So in Mexico, social housing is understood as a tool to kind of have an influence beyond social housing mm -hmm. and have an influence on the market and have an influence on real estate developers, etc. So to change housing behaviors, meanwhile in Spain, mm -hmm. still is not that the case. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. I, I just I think, think that was a, only this exercise. In my experience, it's the same as you described Barcelona. Uh, mm -hmm. It's the same in Mexico. I think this specific <laughs> exercise is an experiment and uh, that's why, uh, why we've done it, but... That's why it's so fortunate, no? so That's so fortunate, yeah. That's this is a prototype of experimentation, yeah. which is, mm -hmm. does not reflect, like, on And actually, the with, with the process of design, like, suddenly, uh, Tatiana invites us all to design t together. That's something that doesn't happen mm -hmm. in social housing collection mm -hmm. in, in Barcelona. So mm -hmm. you don't have, uh, you know, this... Um, these collective discussions that through a, a dialogue and discussion mm -hmm. you have like a group of 
in brilliant minds thinking together about mm -hmm. how to define something. Yeah, it's a really generous act. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's but what Gatton, makes it I so special. I would disagree with I... you because um, you are working probably in five projects that each one of it has also asked you to push the limits. So it's not only territorial. Mm -hmm. No, no, but, uh, but I see it's the spirit of, of Infonavit is, with, uh, with the research mejorando center. La unidad, mm -hmm. is densificando yeah, uh, la so I think there are uh, several projects that uh, they're, they're really pushing limits, even with private developers that you also have worked in different parts of the country that we have worked, and that I think several uh, people that are going to present later on. So I know it is a very small percentage, but I think it is not only like one thing and a fun experiment. I do believe that there is a difference uh, on what is happening in several uh, offices in Mexico than before, mm -hmm. no? with that, no doubt. And I think it's, it's uh, also, um, that's why we are here, because it's, it's special, no? Yeah. It's not the, right. the, the normal practice. But I think it's also um, really important to say that I think it is successful, and I hope that mm -hmm. in other places people mm -hmm. do that kind of experiment, because um, uh, yes, everywhere it's the same. Uh, uh, the, as soon as um, it's, it's social housing or it's highly equipped, like uh, hospitals or so, the book of rules of how you should, the manual of what you should do gets so thick that, um, that you can almost not go out of the box anymore. So this is one successful experiment of how to open that. Okay. Um, I, I think we'll be talking about this throughout the day, for sure, and as we look at other cities and other examples that are presented a little later, but I just wanted to see if there were any questions from the audience. We have time for, there's a question back here, and, and, and Eric also. Most of the presentations I caught the end of um, Ms. Puikaner. Yes. Is that the, okay, uh, present. <laughs> so we have, huge problems in Sunset Park as in many other traditionally working class neighborhoods in New York City, where we be, the displacement, the economic displacement is through the roof. Uh, land disappeared into, public land disappeared into private hands in the last decade or so, while the neighborhoods were still asleep at the wheel of what was coming their way. So my question is somewhat not political maybe, to any of you, uh, did you, while in Mexico City, did you hear the issue of what we would call euphemistically nowadays affordable housing, workforce housing, as part of the political campaign for the presidency? That's my first question, because I'm curious because we're not doing too well with that here. And two, the housing that, that I caught at the end of Ms. Puikaner's presentation with the four stories and those, the, the wonderful. <coughs> I'm sorry, I, have to, I, I right. hate to cut you off, but we just have this one question. Okay, so, so uh, was that, um, if, if I may, was that um, intergenerational or it was just to particularly, one particular uh, generational group? Well, I think in the political um, campaigns, uh, in Mexico, housing is a constitutional right. So it is not only in political campaigns, it is a mandate for the government to uh, provide dignified and enjoyable housing for all, which it's um, never fulfilled completely enough. No, but uh, so it is every, all the time in political campaigns. In terms of, of, uh, of, of social types, I, um, like uh, from the beginning we were all discussing how to address different uh, apartment types, but also how to uh, uh, engage different social types, and that's, uh, that's, that's embedded in all the buildings, so it's not just uh, ours, but in general. Uh, you have to consider that also the site is dividing two, neighbor like two sides of the neighborhood. One is more rough, the other one is more pacified, let's say. So this in between, and none of those areas have services. So there's a huge lack of simple thing as a bakery, a store, you know. So alongside the kind of the wish to have this diversity of social types, it was mainly also to 
be able to kind of connect both areas and allow a process of pacification that it was not radical from one day to, but you know, like smoothing things out from and trying to connect both areas that have actually really different realities through placing services on the ground floor, strategically placed in order to allow that connection to happen. So it's not only through different social ties, but also through different services that we organize together uh, to allow these two communities to start meeting. I just wanted to quickly say that this South Block was done by um, us sitting here in the table and also Tokoma, who's missing, but Martino Tartara is sitting there. So I'm glad that we are all in the auditorium at least. <laughs> Eric, do you want to? Yeah, hi, I'm Eric Bunge. I'm really interested in the uh, relationship between the, uh, the master plan, which is a kind of uh, something we're moving away from as a sort of paradigm shift, the implementation of a lab laboratory of types or prototypes, and the reproducibility, which connects a little bit to Anna's uh, comment about the generic and the specific. So what happens after uh, Territorio de los Gigantes is built? How does Infonavit or the city uh, you know, take this on as, as a framework? To what extent is it reproduced? To what extent does it become a set of rules? To what extent does it become appropriated even before it, you know, it, it, it gets built? How, how, Tatiana, maybe a question for you. How do you imagine this would serve as a catalyst? Well, um, maybe we ask Julia <laughs> then, but I think that... Uh, maybe we just build it first. <laughs> they, well, the idea for, for it is to become uh, a, a, an experiment and to see if really the moves that we did created in this block and then further on in the block that you're also hopefully soon going to start um, designing as well, um, would inform what, what could happen in the rest of the nine kilometers long of this line. So my hope is that this gets built before we have to hand in the rest of the master plan. I'm, I'm really uh, hoping that that timing can happen because it would be very, very formative for the rest of the city uh, if this is tested in a way. One of the um, uh, lines of the Constitution says that the government has to pro provide dignified and enjoyable housing for every Mexican citizen. And Then there, that's in the Constitution, and then there's a lot of laws that uh, direct the, 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 the state how, to, how they have to act, but, the, uh, but it's mandated in the Constitution. All right, I think um, we're, we'll have to save questions for, um, for another break, but thank you so much to the panelists, and we're going right into our second panel, and I'm gonna invite Adam Frampton to the podium. <laughs> <laughs>